Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, guys. That's a, certainly our heart's cry and our heart's desire for our worship services, even today's service. It's good to see you today. Praise the Lord. Glad that you're here. Uh, we've been in a series called Money Matters, and this is the last of a six-week series. Sometimes when you preach about this topic, you get some little rumblings from some folks, but you know, it's been one of those series and, and all of the six weeks we've been preaching, I keep getting back very positive reports of people who have uh, stepped out in faith and begun this venture in their life to really take the promise of Malachi where the Lord says, test me and try me, and are sharing the reports of what God is doing in their life, the freedom they're having in their life, and so it's been a real blessing. You know, we're living in a very spoiled generation. In fact, today's t title of the message is How God Meets My Needs. Sometimes we're more concerned about our other things than our needs. But uh, I couldn't pass this up. I saw this little video this last week, so I just had to include it on, on stuff people say. And the stuff people say is so ridiculous, but it's a result of being so spoiled in the culture that we live in. So uh, here, I'll let you just see what I'm talking about. so I can shut it down. I hate it. I'm like too healthy. I never get to use any of my sick days. Closet full of clothes, nothing to wear. My white noise machine broke last night and I didn't get any sleep. There's nothing to watch. There is nothing to watch. The bottom of my foot has been itching all day, but it tickles when I scratch it. I didn't finish brushing my teeth this morning. My battery died halfway through. I hate that. My hair smells like Starbucks. My hand smells like Starbucks. My iPad smells like Starbucks. That's the worst. Hmm. <laughs> I lost it. Just shoot me. Ah, oh, just shoot me. Put me out of my misery. Kill me now. Just shoot me in the face. Wasn't I just chewing gum? I remember spitting it out. This blanket doesn't have any sleeves. Amen. Contentment. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. But we're certainly living in an age where we have a, our whole concept of reality has changed and we're so spoiled. Uh, all you have to do is you visit some of these third world countries and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You discover how much we have in, in our culture. But as I was preparing for this last final message, I really wanted to do uh, one that dealt with this issue, how God meets my needs. And the reason I really wanted to speak to this is because I've heard over the years and even experienced in my own life at different times where I felt like, well, you know, I have these needs and I don't think God's meeting my needs. And the Bible promises that he'll meet my, my needs. So, you know, why, why isn't the Lord meeting my needs? Why, what's, where's the short circuit here? Because, you know, uh, God promised, but yet I'm not seeing the fulfillment of that promise in my life. So what's up? You ever been in that place in your life? Uh, certainly, I think most of us have. The promise is pretty simple. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 419. How many know that verse by heart? I mean, you, go ahead, you, it's all right to raise your hand. You know, it says Baptist in the small print, but it's okay. <laughs> you've, you've heard that verse, you've read that verse, you've memorized that verse. In fact, there's another translation of the NLT version that puts it a little bit differently, which it goes to, maybe circle those, I'll come back to you in just a moment. But it says, with, uh, well, maybe it doesn't say that. But anyway, let's get back to this. The, I have it written here somewhere. Here it is. The same God who takes care of me, takes care of me, will supply all your needs, 
from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Promise is clear. God says, I'll meet your needs. I'll do it through my relationship with the Lord, obviously, because if you look there, I've circled the word my God. That's, that's the first of this promise is there has to be a relationship between you and God. So there's this ownership that he's your father. And as your father, guess what? You're his child. And so as your father being the child, it's natural for your heavenly father, who's a good father, to take care of you. And this will supply, this shall supply is, 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 is pretty much, it's, and I'm going to meet your needs. In fact, when God makes a statement like this, you have to realize he's staking his character. This is a promise. This has to do with his own personal integrity. You know, he says, for those who accept my son, for those who are of a relationship with me, I'm, I'm going to meet your needs. In fact, there's that word, all your needs that is circled. It doesn't say some. My God shall supply some of my needs. Part of my notes, if there are needs, he promises that he is going to meet those needs. You say, what are they? These are legitimate needs in your life. Food, shelter, clothing, those things like that. That God says, hey, without a doubt, I'm going to take care of these things. And the Bible makes it clear. I'm a wealthy God. I own everything. That was one of the principles we learned in the very first sermon about the biblical principles we should understand on stewardship and on, on finances, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to God. And God is saying, since I own everything, I'm rich enough to take care of whatever your needs might be. But there have been times in my own life where I had to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm having some legitimate needs here. You know, and I don't think you lied because the Bible says you can't lie. And I, I certainly don't think you exaggerated, nor do I believe, God, that you failed. So there has to be a, a problem here. And it's probably in my understanding. Why is it that there are needs that are being represented in my life or my ministry or in the church, perhaps, that aren't being met? What, what's the promise? You know, what's the deal with this promise? Well, the promise is, is clear. But understand, as it says on the overhead there, is that with every promise, there is a premise. There's some conditions. There's a, God usually puts a word like, if my people, th those kind of things, if we confess our sins, God forgives and, and, and cleanses us, but there's this premise of confession of our sin. You know, that we, we acknowledge where we are, we acknowledge what we've done. God has paid the price already to forgive me, has he not? At the cross, everything was taken care of. So I need to claim this promise, but hey, if, if, there's no, if there's no confession of my sin, then certainly there's no, there's no fulfillment on the, on the promise. So here's this, here's this promise. God has given us a premise. And in all that we've studied over the last five weeks, now six, we've looked at all these spiritual principles. We've looked at all these things about saving and the principles of, of credit and spending, principles of giving and principles of investing and using your resources wisely and realizing that you're a steward of all that God's given you. Let's, let's get down to this issue. If you have a need and it's not being met, then what, what's the problem? What are these premises that perhaps I'm missing? Well, I want to lay down five for you today in, in this message, and we're going to go through each one of these five things. They are, here's the premise, and I think these are based on biblical, financial, scriptural things. One, if I ask for his help. Two, if I learn to be content. Three, if I practice giving in faith. Four is, if I maintain my integrity. That's doing my character. And five, if I trust him with my life. God promises to meet my needs. And I think as, you, if we, as we have studied all these biblical elements and all these biblical financial principles over the last weeks, we've kind of, kind of drawn these five things out of all that to say, here's the premise for the promise. So I encourage you today, if you're in that situation where needs aren't being met, you kind of go back with me through this little journey here and, and let's look and see what the Bible says. First of all, I think this is obvious, but it's often overlooked. If I ask for help, James makes it clear, you know, you do not have because you don't ask God. I mean, that's pretty clear. God is simply saying here, you know, the, the storehouse is shut. The windows are shut. The supply is not being there because, you're, you know, you're not asking for help. You, you don't pray. You, you, you haven't come to me. You haven't presented these needs to me. You haven't acknowledged your, your need for me in your life. So I'm guessing many times the first reason a lot of people don't have it because we just we get into this kind of uh, this, this attitude of, of, uh, of expectation without any faith or without any gratitude. Well, God's going to take care of that. But yet we never go to the Lord and we never commit to the Lord and we don't ask the Lord. And when we don't, you know, we miss God. 
And then we go out and perhaps at the same kind of time, instead of asking God about what we're doing with our money, like what with our, we're doing with our purchases, we just go out and get something. We haven't asked the Lord to provide it. We haven't asked God to meet that need. We've just simply said, hey, I've got a credit card. I'll just go out and I'll just buy it. I love this passage in, in, where Jesus says, you know, uh, hey, ask. It'll be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you. If you circle the first letter of all those words, at the start of the sentence, you get the word ask. Ask, seek, and knock. This is, this is an important principle. And this is, that is so simple, I believe that due to the simplicity, we overlook it. And we get into this, all this complex stuff about how God's not meeting my need. And maybe it's just because we're not asking. In fact, in the New Testament alone, there's over 20 times where the Lord is telling us, commanding us to ask. I want you to ask. One of the reasons why a lot of people never see God do some big stuff in their life, some miraculous things in their life, many times they just don't ask. You want to see God do something in your life? You want to see God do more in your life? Maybe we should spend some more time asking. In fact, I have this little law that we tried to teach our children concerning this principle, even when they were growing up. You know, it's before you pay for it, pray for it. How many things would, would we be willing to allow the Lord to do for us? We just assume on ourselves and go get it because that's what we want. We tried to teach this to our children when they were little. You know, they, daddy can have this, daddy can have that, mommy can have this, can have that. Say, hey, well, let, no, let, let's just pray about it. If the Lord, I guarantee you, if the Lord wants me to get this for you, I'm going to get it for you. But maybe the Lord doesn't want me to get it for you. Maybe the Lord wants to provide somebody else provide for it. And we saw that carried out in, in their young lives in, in such miraculous and incredible ways. I mean, Cherish wanted this particular kind of doll. You know, got to have this kind of doll. I said, well, Cherish, you know, she's probably, what, five years old. Uh, well, let's pray about this. And so we, every night, you know, we get down to, beside the bed and, and she'd be praying, bless mommy and daddy. And, and Lord, you know, I want such and such doll. I didn't feel inclined to buy it for it all. And you say, you're hard-hearted looking at that little five-year-old baby girl. No, I just, you know, try to be sensitive to the Lord in these issues. We were not, we were not pastoring them. We were in evangelism and traveling ministry and things like that. I, you know, the next revival that we went to were in a church there. Without letting anybody know anything, there was this one lady in the church who just felt obliged that she needed to go out and buy my daughter something. And she went out and bought her this exact doll that she was wanting. Now, if a five-year-old can learn that, can't we learn that? You know, before you, before you pay for it, pray for it. You know, you say, well, I need a new washer. Pray for one. God either might surprise you with some extra income or he may just have somebody give it to you. How many times have we seen that in your own life? You've seen where God just comes in and meets a need because somebody was simply asking for the need. So principle number one, if God's not meeting your need, let's start praying. Why? He's a loving father. It's in his delight and his desire as a loving father to bestow blessings and, and to benefit his children. I mean, my kids ask for stuff. You know, there's a desire to meet those needs. My grandkids is a desire. Uh, you think the father's any less? He wants, to, he wants to bless us. What does Jesus tell his disciples? He's getting ready to leave. He's going to ascend to the father. The crucifixion is getting ready to happen. The resurrection is about to take place. And before he goes, final words are, by the way, gentlemen, You've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you'll receive so that your joy will be the fullest possible joy. I want you to ask so that your joy can be full. I want you to ask. So you're, I mean, what can be, bring any greater fullness of joy that, to know that, hey, God's looking out for me. God's concerned about my needs. And I can really go and ask God about these issues. And he's a God who cares enough to listen to these personal elements in my life. And he does something about it. Why do I ask him? So he can give it. Why does he want to give it? Because he's my father. He wants me to receive it. Why does he want me to receive it? So my joy will be full. That's what he says here. So the first point here, in regard to this issue of why God's not meeting my need, if you pray as much about your finances as you worry about them, you'd have a lot less to worry about. So God says, I'm waiting for you to ask me. Ask and it shall be given. The second point of why God doesn't meet our need is in this area here. We need to learn what contentment is. We need to learn what it means to be content. I don't know where I got this quote, but listen to it carefully. I don't know why Americans, the only people in the world, spend money they don't have for things they don't need 
to impress people they don't like. <laughs> Amen. Welcome to the USA. And I bring this point up because we talk about contentment. This has a lot to do with our personal character and what we, you know, and, and dealing with issues of <clears throat> just, just kind of greediness and the covetousness that enters our life. We, there's, a, there's a point where you begin to grow up and you begin to mature in life and you realize that life is not just about what you want, what you can get and what you can have. You begin to realize that life is about your relationship to your heavenly father and your relationship to the world around you and others become more important. You reach a place of becoming mature and Jesus starts being manifest in your life and his love for people and his interest for others and, and, and meeting needs, it becomes important to you. It's not just having what you've got. Paul wrote to Timothy in, in, in 1 Timothy, he said, listen, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. We brought nothing into the world. We take nothing out of it. I was present at the birth of my two children. They came in with nothing. They weren't dressed. They didn't have diapers. The diapers that weren't there didn't have pockets. You know, there was, they, they, didn't, they didn't bring the first month's living expenses with them. You know, they didn't bring payment for the medical bills. They just came in and assumed position. Child's here. They came in and guess what? And when we go, when they go, when I go, it's the same way. You know where they make barrel suits at funeral homes? You, you can order your suit from the funeral home. They don't make them with pockets in them. Get the fake pockets. Why? You ain't putting anything in them. You can't, you're not going to have anything in eternity except what God clothes you with. That's supposed to be the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So you may get a lot of stuff and you may acquire a lot of things here on this earth and you may get a lot of things. Hey, but when you leave, they stay in back. They're not, they're not going to go with you. As much as you may have gotten, I don't care what the collection might be, what the hobby might be, it's not going to go with you. But we have got to, to learn, and what we failed to learn, especially in this materialistic culture that we live in, is this whole element of contentment. And don't misunderstand contentment, because some people do. They don't understand what it means to be content. To be content doesn't mean that you don't have goals. It doesn't mean that you don't have ambitions. And it doesn't mean that you don't have some financial goals even. But it does mean that you're not just driven by greed and you're not driven by selfishness, you know. Contentment means that your happiness in your life is not dependent upon things. It's not dependent upon circumstances. To be content means that I'm no longer living with the win and then mentality. You say, what's the win and then mentality? When I get more money, then I'll give. When I get more money, then I'll be happy. When I get a better car, then I can do this. When I get a certain job, when I can retire, then I'll be happy. When I get the house paid off, when I get the bill, then, 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 then. When this happens, then this can take place. The problem with that is, is we always have another win. There's always something else that we want. There's always something more on the list. You remember the famous millionaire Howard Hughes, at one point in time was the most wealthy man in the world, especially at the height in the 50s, you know, when he was making all the 60s or whatever it was, and he was so stinking rich. They asked a reporter, he says, how much does it take, Mr. Hughes, to make a man happy in life? His response was, just a little more. Just a little more. I've kind of written my own proverb, to the end, to the, there is no end to the wanting of things. Why? Because we just don't learn to be content. The Apostle Paul talked about contentment to Timothy. He also wrote of it in his own life in Philippians chapter 4 when he says, you know, I know how to get along with humble means and I know how to live in prosperity. But in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and not having abundance, suffering need. What's the secret? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What's he saying here? When I'm in trouble, I trust in the Lord. When I'm in abundance, I trust in the Lord. When I've got money, I trust in the Lord. When I don't have money, I trust in the Lord. Because my life and my joy and my peace is in the Lord. That's contentment. That's contentment, which so many people don't un understand. And, and according to what Paul says, listen to what he writes. He says, I have learned I believe contentment has to be learned. I believe it can be learned. I just don't think a lot of people are pursuing that education of learning what it means to be content. And the primary reason that we, we don't give, the primary reason we don't save, the primary reason we don't, we don't do the things that I believe God would have us do in ministry, 
We've developed all these bad habits of spending, and most of it's due to root cause many times is greed or discontentment. We always think that things will bring us more happiness or, or make us more full and complete. I believe the primary reason we don't do it is it, 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 it's because of discontentment. And out of that comes what I call about a list of about four bad spending habits. So hold on just a minute. If you're a seeker sensitive kind of Christian, you know you don't like things that might hurt your feelings, plug your ears. All right, you know, like they tell you on TV, you might cover your children's ears or you know, turn them away from the TV because this, this part here is, is a mature audience. You're ready for it if you're mature. <laughs> One, you're an impulsive spender. Impulsive spender just sees stuff. They, and they see the stuff and they think, I just have to have it. It's new. It's glamorous. It, it sparkles. Everybody on TV is, is telling how wonderful it is. And if I don't have it... I'll, uh, shopping networks love these people, all right? I, I got to have it. I got to have it. I got to have it. I got to have it now, you know? I'm not going to pray for it. I'm going to go pay for it. But really, MasterCard's going to pay for it, and I'm going to be in debt to them. So this is, this, is, this is terrible spending it. Another is what we call the compulsive spender. Now, compulsive spending usually comes from a person whose needs are just unmet in their life. They don't know how to have their needs met through Jesus Christ. And they're trying to fill a vacuum in their life. They have this hole and they really think that if they just get one more thing or, or, or something, that that one thing or those things are going to be the very key that opens the door to success and fulfillment and happiness in their life. But they never find it and they just keep spending compulsively. Then the other spender, now this is where some of you really get offended. It's what we call the special interest spender. This person kind of does well in keeping a budget until it comes to this one soft spot. This one area of weakness. See how quiet it's getting? <laughs> that they just got to spend more money on. It could be golf. It could be sports. It could be guns. It could be music. I got to have that equipment. I need it. It could be technology. It's just a week. It could be shoes. Now we've gone to meddling. <laughs> I got to have those shoes. I need those shoes. If I have those shoes, that's the last pair I'll need. Until I see the next pair. I've just got to have those heels. It's the will of God. <laughs> I've got to have those. It's those special, and, and those are the things that will sink your boat faster than anything. Those are the things that that's where we step back and say, pray about it before I pay, pray for it, before I pay for it. God, you want me to have this? You're going to provide it. I just, it, but what happens? And then there's this last one we call the status seeker spender. This is the person who really is that guy we talked about. He just wants to impress people he doesn't like. He wants others to think he's important. He wants to somehow feel elevated in life. And he's got to have, you know, the top of the top and the best of the best of everything that is purchased because he's really looking for approval from the world. And what a waste and what a, a, a pursuit, what a waste of energy and what a waste of finances. Our, our relationship in life for happiness is dependent upon, first of all, the most important relationship. I'm not trying to appeal to you. I want to appeal to God. I want to be appealing to God. I want to find favor with God. I want to find God's blessings on my life. And so that's the status that I ought to be seeking. My relationship and my love for Jesus ought to be the thing that drives me, not a relationship and a love for the world and what the world has to offer me. I need to learn what? Contentment. That's kind of the second requirement we talk about for God meeting your, your needs. Contentment. I think God is telling us our, part of our problem is that when we start looking to the world and we, we're comparing ourselves and, you know, let me ask you this question. Can God trust us with what he puts in our hands? Are we driven by these bad spending habits? Have we learned to be content with what he gives and realize that maybe he's giving it the extra to us at this point in time, not so I can get big, bigger, better, and more. Maybe he's giving me the extra so I can make an influence for the kingdom of God, bigger, better, and more. Maybe I can touch more lives. Maybe I can meet somebody's needs. Maybe I can be the person that reaches out and helps that person in need. Maybe I can be that person who doesn't take that extra hundred bucks and spends it on me. Maybe he wants to give it to the waitress. Where's the freedom in our life to do those kind of things if we don't learn contentment? You know, I, I don't understand all the scriptures thoroughly. And there's this one thing that, that is puzzling perhaps in some degree until you understand this issue about contentment. Why does God make money such an acid test in our life? 
Why does God say, if you cannot be faithful with unrighteous mammon, I can't trust you with true riches? I didn't write that. God wrote that. Why does he make this, this issue of, of money such an, an acid test for our life? I think he does it so that we, we realize that I shouldn't be driven by the world. And materialism and greed and covetousness and desire for stuff. I should be driven by the Holy Spirit in my life. And I need to live by the power of God's word and by his presence and by his spirit and not by what the world is offering. That my happiness is never going to be satisfied out here with stuff. So I learn how to handle what God's given me so I find my happiness, my contentment, and my joy in him. And if I don't learn that, I'll never be happy in this life because stuff never brings peace and it never brings happiness. The third principle here in regard to God meeting our needs is this one, the premise to the promise you practice giving in faith. And I say faith giving because I think we need to understand this aspect. Faith says, I really do believe God. The Bible tells that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So God speaks his word to me. I truly believe what he says. I truly believe what he says about all these financial scriptures he's laid out in the word of God. So since I truly believe those things, it, it is put into practice in the way I live my life, in the way I handle what God has given me. And I'm giving it because I believe God and I'm giving it because I, I trust the Lord. Here in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, you'll see it on the screen, where he tells us, I say this to you, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly, or under compulsion. Somebody made you do it. No, because God loves a cheerful giver. If ever you feel pressured to give, folks, you're missing this element of cheerful giving. Amen. If ever you come to the place that you feel like somebody's making you give, you're missing this element of cheerful giving. You should give because you love God. And you should give because you're, there's a joy that comes from knowing you're doing what God's told you to do. Now, the idea in this passage is everybody should give. You're going to have to decide how you're going to do it. You can give a little bit or you can give a lot. And how you receive, it's the principle of the harvest that we've talked about several times where he says, give and it will be given. So give to receive. And by all that, it'll be given back. How do you want to get back? Do you want to get back bountifully or sparingly? So if you give a little, you get back a little bit more. You get a lot more, you get back a lot more. So you decide how, what kind of blessing you want to receive. And then you do, and what you do, you do it with a motive of, I love God and I'm doing this because I believe what God says. I believe that God is faithful. I believe God's going to meet my needs. I believe that I don't have to worry about this. I know the truth. How can I give freely? I know the truth. How can I give abundantly? I know the truth. I know what God said, and I know that God is faithful, and I know God can be trusted. And I'm going to manifest my obedience that's the, that's the truth. That's the evidence. That's the, that's the sign that says, I really do believe God. I'm going to obey God and trust in the Lord. It's a simple law. What we call the law of the universe is what he's writing here. Whatever you sow, Galatians says, you sow criticism, guess what you get back? People are critical to you. <coughs> Excuse me, you sow kindness, what do you get back? You sow love, you sow generosity, you get it back. You receive it back. And it's true with money as much as it's true with anything else. You remember the passage where the Lord says, listen, your ways are not my ways. What we've talked about for now, going on the six weeks, this is not the ways of the world, is it? The world doesn't believe this. The world says, hey, you, what you need is you need to save or you need to keep and you need to hoard and you need to, you need to take care of number one because number one is who's important. Well, number one is God. It's not you. And one thing about being number one, you know what his major characteristic is in scripture? He's a giver. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And if there's one characteristic I believe God wants us to learn from him is that same characteristic of generosity and benevolence and mercy and compassion and love. The Lord's saying here, I love you so much, I'll meet all your needs. I love you so much, I'm going to take care of all your needs. But here's the way I want to do it. I want you to, we used to call it prime the pump. You got to prime the pump. To prime the old pumps, they'd have to push and pump, and then they'd pour water down the line, and they'd prop it up some more, and pretty soon the, the well would open up and, and would flow. We pour in something to get something out, you know? 
I mean, look at this passage of Scripture here. And when, when the Lord's speaking it to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, you know, my God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you in all things, at all times, will have all you need and you'll abound in every good work. What's that mean? God says, I'm going to meet your needs to the point your needs are met and you have enough left over to, to meet other people's needs. That's what that abound to every good work is. But catch this. I mean, these superlatives, I mean, all, 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 all. That's the promise of God. God is able, get that down. Do you believe he's able? God is able to make all grace about it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and even chapter 8, 8 and 9, both in the context of these verses, one we just read a while ago, and this one are written in the context of Paul giving instruction by the Holy Spirit to these people how they should be handling what God's given to them financially. It's in the context. If we, t if we preach this any other way, it's taken out of context. In the context of this, God said, I'll meet your needs. So that in every situation, you'll have everything you need. And not only so, he said, I'll meet your needs so much that you'll be able to, 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 to meet other needs. And I believe this is the biblical, the biblical principle of prosperity right here. Not this hyper stuff you get out in this prosperity preachers and, you know, health and wealth and all that mess you get out in the world. But in actuality, the balance of scripture does teach that God meets our needs and God wants to meet our needs at all times. But God wants to meet our needs so we have enough to meet other people's needs. That's true picture prosperity. That God's meeting my needs in abundance so that I have to help meet other people's needs. That's biblical prosperity. But if I don't practice giving this simple principle of just putting it out there and planting it and giving it, guess what? Then it doesn't come back. Proverbs puts it this way. In chapter 3, honor the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income and he will fill your barns to overflow. Do what? Take the first portion. We've talked about first fruits. Some people call it tithe, the 10%. It's really just the, the beginning, off the top, the cream of the crop, so to say. It comes right out. That goes to the Lord. That goes before Uncle Sam gets his in reality. Amen? That gets to heaven before it gets to the IRS. I, the Lord, you get first part of everything that I make. I'm going to honor you in this way. And I hate to even just present it as, a, as, a, as 10% because if you're stuck at 10%, you're missing some of the greater blessings of God. You know, I, I believe it's J.C. Penney who said, my goal, and R.G. Laterno has the great Laterno Business School. Those guys said our goal was to be able to live off 10% and give 90% of the Lord. And by the time they died, both those men were given 90% away and keeping 10% to live on. That's an incredible goal, is it not? We're trying to see how much can we keep. You know, we, we, we have the distinction is not there. It's, it's, it, we don't understand that tithing is a way we honor God. Honor the Lord. You give him the first fruits. And really, if you want to say it, me giving that way, you really want to mean it, it is an act of worship. That's why we have these offering receptacles at the door. If you, if you look in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, you'll see they had these, these offering boxes. As people would enter in to the temple to worship, they would come in and they place their gifts in as an act of worship as they went into worship the Lord. That's the biblical way. It, it, it's, a, it's a picture, it's a testimony that you're here to worship God. And one of the ways you worship God is with your life and every part of your life. And you believe what God says, put me first in your life. Seek you first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God says, I'll take care of everything else. You won't have to worry about a thing. You're just, you, just, you just honor me, you respect me, you love me. I'll take care of everything you have in life that comes up. I'll take care of your needs. Now, but he didn't say take care of your greeds. I'll take care of your needs. So, well, I can't really afford to do that. You can't afford not to do that. If you're a believer, you know, April is coming around, mid-April. Y'all know what mid-April is, right? IRS day. And I just ruined the whole sermon by saying that, didn't I? <laughs> just put a damper on your day. It's amazing how many people work so hard to make sure that they render unto Caesar what's Caesar because they don't want the audit and all the stuff. So they're just getting everything in order and they're looking for the deductions and everything. They're just struggling real hard. Why, why, why do we give to Caesar, so to, as, as Jesus said? We render unto Caesar what's Caesar? Because people are afraid of Caesar. Afraid of what the government will do to them if they don't render that. If I get caught. Why do we give to God? He said, God loves a cheerful giver. There's a different kind of fear we have towards the Lord than what we would have towards the IRS. Our fear for God is really just a holy respect for God. 
I prefer him over everyone else, everything else. He gets first place. And if I seek you first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added unto me. Put me first in your life. See what I'll do in your life. See what I will do. And that passage is over and over throughout scripture. The fourth principle is if I maintain my integrity. And walking in integrity is an important thing. You know, basically God's saying, you know, I'll assume responsibility ultimately for all your financial needs, but you need to be a person of character. God doesn't bless dishonesty. There's a couple of passages here in Proverbs you, you can see that says the Lord demands fairness in every business deal. Proverbs 19, one says, better to be poor and honest than rich and dishonest. Now this is kind of where the rubber meets the road with a lot of people, especially in the culture we live in, always looking for a way we can, you know, kind of pull something over on somebody else, you know, or get more money out of the deal and maybe get more value out of something than what the real value is there. People have a tendency just to lie they, and, and be dishonest. This is part of the generation that, that we're living in. We, we just, we're living in a dishonest world. People that won't be just real and honest with us. But if you go through Proverbs, there's so many biblical financial principles. We've been re- going through Proverbs on Wednesday nights. And there's so many principles in there that God's just saying, this is the way you'll be blessed. If you're like this, you'll be blessed. If you're lazy, I'm not going to bless you. If you're dishonest, I'm not going to bless you. There's lots of passages that talk about fair balances and the way that we deal in our business dealings with just scales, so to say. In other words, if, 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 you're, if you're selling a pound of something, make sure it's a real pound, not three quarter of a pound. You know, it's like buying two by fours. When's the last time you ever saw a real two by four? They quit making two by fours 40 years ago. Amen. Because we figure we can save off just a little bit more and get some more wood. You save off a little bit more. We don't really put the full amount in. We don't really be honest. And when we're not honest, guess what? God makes it very clear. I'm not going to bless you. If you're going to be a dishonest, immoral person in your life, I'm not going to bless that. And we're living with people who have such pressure in their life. They're always trying to get ahead or they're always trying to keep up or they're always trying to get more that they're really tempered, tempted to compromise on their ethics. And they're not walking in integrity. They kind of shade the truth in order to make another dollar. Or they overvalue something in order to make another dollar. Or they don't tell the absolute truth about what the, 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 the deal or the barter is really all about. And because of it, they're not experiencing the blessings of God. So as we talk about finances, it's important to realize that in all your dealings, it's important to be honest, even your dealings with God. Well, I'm, I'm going to honor the Lord my first fruits. You see the story of Cain and Abel. That was a fr- first fruit story. One bought first fruits. One did not bring the first fruits. And the one who did not bring the first fruits, he got mad at God when he didn't get the blessings of God. And you saw what happened as a result of all that. I believe the first, the first murder was over money. And who the Lord honored and who the Lord didn't honor because of the way they brought their offerings. Let me just a final word on this particular point. Do not be anxious about it in ever, anything. But in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends and passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Be honest. You're not lying and cheating and stealing, you're not going to make anything of that. And you're going to lose everything. The Bible makes it clear in Proverbs, everything you gain dishonestly is never last. In fact, it's usually wasted on something else. Takes it right away. You don't get to enjoy it. The fifth is the last, and these all tie together, obviously. But if I trust him with my life. Come back to that Matthew 6 verse. You know, your father in heaven knows what you need. So seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That, that another translation talks about your heavenly father already knows perfectly well what you need and he will give it to you if you give him first place in your life and live the way he wants you to live. Just as children would trust their daddy for money, we should be trusting our heavenly father for our needs. That's what the verse is telling us. In fact, I believe the only creation, created thing in all of creation that does any worrying is probably humans. Jesus said, what are you worrying about? Look to your father. He feeds the birds. You don't think you're more important than birds? I hope I'm more important than birds in God's eyes. God loves birds, but I know he loves, he loves people a lot more. Amen? He loves people incredibly so much that he died for them. And if we, could, if we, if we choose not to understand that or realize that we have this loving heavenly father who wants to be benevolent to us as his children, then we start living with this fear. Well, I just don't know if I'm, my needs are going to be met, or if I'm going to make it next week, or if I'm going to make it next month. You know what that worry is? It's really just kind of a, a simplistic form of atheism. 
Every time I enter that kind of worry circle, I'm just acting like an atheist. They don't anybody to trust, anybody to believe. We have someone to trust, someone we can believe. So if you're seeing that little worry light go off in your heart, kind of like a little warning light, it should be saying to you, hey, slow down. You're starting to doubt the love of God. Step back. You're starting, you're starting to move towards the flesh. You're, you're beginning to doubt God's grace on your life. And so I, I add this as an important principle, God meeting my needs. I really must say, God, I trust you with my life. That's so what Paul wrote Timothy again. He said, don't put your hope in wealth. That is so uncertain. How many of you know that? But put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. I don't know if you realize it. Some of you are old enough to realize it. Everything can be gone in an instant in the culture we live in. Everything can be gone in a moment. Jobs, savings, 401s, investments, stock, down the bottom. It can be gone. I love these guys who get on TV and tell you this. And there's so many, you know, on TV now. Oh, what you need to do is you need to come to my seminar and buy my book about the coming bust. And so, you know what we'll do? Basically, we'll sell you all these books. You're going to charge you all this money to come to my seminar. And then we'll send you my monthly newsletter for about 100 bucks a month. Plus, you're going to invest your money in gold. I'm going to show you how to do that. That guy wasn't around in the Depression, was he? When they made it illegal to own gold. <laughs> yeah, it's all uncertain. You know, the only thing that makes those guys rich is driving you by fear. That stuff doesn't, doesn't affect me when it hits me. Why? Because my trust is not in gold. It's not in gold we trust. It's in God we trust. Right. And neither is yours, is it? No, it's not. Your trust is in God. I'm not saying you don't save. I'm not saying you don't invest wisely, biblically, scripturally, following biblical lines of honesty and integrity. But hey, ultimately you realize that God is your only security. It's not your bank account and it's not the government. God is your security. It's in the Lord. That's why he said to Timothy, don't put your hope in wealth. It is so uncertain. Psalms 111, 5 says, he gives food to those who trust him and he never forgets his promises close with two verses here one is in Romans what shall then we say these things if God is for us who can be against us and he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all of us how shall he not with him his son also freely give us all things my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He's saying, if God loved you enough to send his son to die for you, don't you think God's big enough to take care of you? All your other needs? Hey, listen, meeting your light bill is no big deal. You know what was a, you know what was a big deal? Your sin bill. <laughs> that was a big deal. Because the price on that was death. And Jesus paid that price. What do we do? We ask. I sought the Lord and he heard me, it says in Psalms 34. He delivered me from all our fears. If we're really serious about understanding this, the, the premise of the promise of God meeting all my needs, then I want to challenge you today. One, start asking God. Ask him for help in your finances. Seek his word about what he says about spending, and charging, and credit in these issues. I'm going to start asking the Lord before I make these decisions. Number two, I'm going to start learning to be content with what I have and stop comparing myself with other people because that only causes discontentment. Number three, I'm going to start giving first part of my income just like the Lord commanded in faith. I'm going to do it believing God to take care of my needs. I'm going to do it as an act of worship. I'm going to do it trusting the Lord because I believe God's big enough to do what he said he would do. I don't have to worry about that. God promised he'd do that. I'm going to live with integrity in my finances. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to be dishonest. I'm not going to lie about stuff. I'm going to walk in a place of honesty. The Bible says if we worship God, we worship him in spirit and in truth. I'm trusting, number five, Jesus Christ completely with every area of my life. Now, a lot of people say the fifth one, but they won't do the four before it. You can't do the four before it without doing the fifth one. <laughs> Vice versa. All right? They all go together. If you're doing one, you're probably doing five. If you're doing five, you're doing three. Right on down the line. Jesus put it even more simply than that. If you love me, keep my commandments. Trust my word. That's all he's saying. 
If you love me, then trust me. How do I demonstrate I trust him? I keep his word. I do what he's telling me to do. You could, you could invert that verse. You know, if you don't love me, don't do what I say. If you don't love me, you know, you won't do what I say. But really, this gets down to, I think, what Paul mentioned right there and when he talked about being a cheerful giver. This has to do with a heart that's right. When we have a heart of worship and there's a heart of joy, it just ties in that way. Amen? Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, you know...